Hey guys, and welcome to Taylor Tech. So as I talked about in my virtualization at home video, uh, one of the first things I wanted to do was uh, do a virtual PFSense router um, to kind of be the core of my home network. So let's go over why PFSense, the pluses and minuses of a virtual setup over versus a physical setup. Um, conceptually, what a virtualized PFSense router looks like on a network. Um, we'll do a brief overview of how to set up your hypervisor for it and get everything installed. And finally, uh, go over an issue that I had when I was trying to use multiple NICs on the machine within the same network. So first off, why PFSense in the first place? Well, as I've been getting into home labbing, um, I've quickly outgrown the uh, functionality of my home Wi-Fi router. You know, like most people, I had just your, your basic uh, Linksys home router, home all-in-one solution that tried to do everything, um, but it wasn't capable of doing a lot of the things I really wanted it to do. Um, and so I started looking at other solutions. How could I, uh, how could I do more? How could I have something with which I could actually learn instead of just have a, you know, a basic device that kind of hides all the advanced functionality from me. Um, and when I was looking at various solutions, um, I quickly decided on doing a software solution instead of a hardware solution. Part of the reason for that was that um, a lot of the hardware solutions I was seeing out there um, were one, they were going to be expensive. Two, uh, I knew that I was going to at some point move past gigabit networking um, and uh, anything past gigabit networking for a routing solution is really expensive. Um, I know you can't do 10 gigabit on PFSense, but you can go over one gigabit. And finally, uh, from what I had researched, PFSense had so many options and so much flexibility, it was going, I realized it was going to be a great learning tool for learning basic networking, which is an area I personally struggle at. Another thing that really drew me to PFSense in particular is it has a really broad user base. It's got a lot of plugins for it that you can use to enhance the functionality of your network uh, beyond just basic routing. Uh, so I thought that was really cool. Um, what it really boils down to is PFSense is kind of like the Swiss army knife of networking uh, applications. Uh, there's very little that it can't do. And while it doesn't always do everything perfectly, um, it is at least going to have the basic functionality to, to do just about anything. To give you an idea of some of the different things you can do with PFSense plugins, um, you know, you can do things like a local proxy so that you're not having to go out and fetch a file from the internet every time uh, using the squid plugin. URL filtering and redirecting with SquidGuard, which will let you block URLs that you don't want anyone on your network to have access to. Intrusion de detection and blocking with a plugin called Snort, um, so you can see if people are trying to attack your network. Uh, network antivirus with Clam AV, so uh, basically you can block uh, viruses before they even make it to the local machine. You know, the so at the network layer you're blocking them, which is really awesome. And finally, IP blocking with PF blocker, which you can kind of use like an ad blocker, provided you know the IP addresses of all of the ad network machines. And there are lists out there you can get. So many of the things I'm listing here are enterprise level features that you're not really going to see on any other home uh, routing solution out there. And even then, if you go out and buy an enterprise router, a lot of these things may not be enabled by default. You may need special licensing, or they may just not be possible with just that one device. You may need multiple devices to do some of this functionality. The fact that you can do it all in PFSense is really awesome. And that's why it's such a popular uh, routing solution out there. A lot of people, when they do PFSense, they do a physical box. And I understand that. It makes a lot of sense. You know, you want to make sure that your network is up. The problem with that is, one, you know, reliable redundant hardware is expensive. And two, uh, you're going to be using a lot of power for something that doesn't take a lot of power. Uh, you know, you, unless you're doing more than gigabit routing, or you have a ton of plugins you, running, PFSense is just going to use a tiny fraction of the compute resources and the memory in any even remotely modern machine. And I'm talking anything in the last 10 years. When you look at what most home routers you have in terms of hardware, they have a tiny single core processor that's not even running at gigahertz and maybe, you know, 256 megabytes of RAM. So even the most basic machine is going to have a few gigs of RAM and, you know, a decent two plus gigahertz processor that's going to be way overkill for a routing solution. So you, since you don't need all of that power from a physical machine, it doesn't really make sense to run one all the time. Another thing is that having a virtual machine can, in a lot of cases, make backup and recovery a lot easier. Um, it's really easy to just take a snapshot of an entire VM. You get all of the configuration, all the setup, 
you know, the, the entire state of the machine ready to go. And um, as long as you can safely store those backups, you can easily bring a, a corrupted uh, PFSense box back online in a snap just by restoring that VM snapshot. Uh, another thing is easy resource expandability. Uh, I, you know, personally want to go past the gigahertz barrier at some point with my home network um, and get, you know, a multi gigabit WAN. And when I do that, I'm going to need more resources in my router. Uh, so the ability to expand that by just adding more resources and rebooting the VM is awesome. And that's something that I hope I can take advantage of in the future. Uh, the next thing is a lot better compatibility with hardware. Um, when you virtualize your the PFSense install, you no longer have to worry about each individual piece of hardware, each individual NIC that you're going to use being compatible with it because they have to be compatible with your hypervisor. And then your hypervisor presents them virtually to your PFSense router. So um, I know that a lot of people who get Mellanox uh, ConnectX NICs have trouble getting them to work with PFSense because you have to basically install the driver on your own, um, you know, put the driver in the kernel on your own and do basically a custom build of PFSense, which is kind of frustrating. Um, I didn't have to go through any of that. Uh, Hyper-V recognized the Mellanox cards instantly because Windows has a native driver for it, and then it presented a virtual 10 gigabit uh, network. Uh, interface to the PFSense install and PFSense knew how to use that instantly with no settings or configuration needed. So hardware compatibility is an awesome reason to virtualize. And finally, it's a lot easier to create and play with test environments, which is, you know, one of the core awesome things about virtualization in my book. Uh, and we'll see that here is I uh, spin up a new VM, put PFSense on it, and we go through the configuration process. Of course, nothing is perfect. Um, virtualization does add a layer of complexity to everything you do with it, and that includes routing. Um, so it makes the network environment a little bit more complex. Um, also, your network stability is now dependent on your hypervisor host stability. If for any reason your, your virtualization machine goes down, your entire house's network goes down, and that uh, can cause a lot of problems. So if you're going to do this, make sure that you have a reliable machine to do it on so that you're not accidentally killing your entire network when uh, your host machine dies. Okay, so finally we're going to talk about uh, what a virtualized PFSense install looks like, what the network topology looks like for it. So what I'm going to do is put up on the screen a, uh, a network diagram that I made of what my home network looks like right now. So as you can see from the diagram, uh, you know, we've got the uh, R710 hypervisor host and everything in that white box is that is inside that virtualization machine. Um, you've got a 10 gigabit network connection, uh, a one gigabit LAN connection, and a one gigabit WAN connection. Um, the one gigabit WAN is obviously attached to the cable modem. The one gigabit LAN is attached to my current Wi-Fi router in bridging mode so that it's just acting as a bridge and passing network connections through. <clears throat> and the 10 gigabit LAN is being used to connect all of my 10 gigabit devices through my 10 gig switch. You'll note that though it's not just showing the NICs on the box, it's showing them as if they are switches. And that's because uh, most hypervisors, all the major ones that I'm aware of, for type 1 hypervisors, they present network interface cards not as an interface itself, but as a switched interface. So multiple, that way multiple virtual machines can be attached to the same network interface. Um, this is how. PFSense, this is how your hypervisor can present any uh, network device to PFSense, and PFSense doesn't have to have a specific driver for it because it has seen the hypervisor's uh, virtualized network interface. So as you can see, we've got all of the external NICs connected to the PFSense box. In addition, we've got a private uh, virtual switch that is my internal DMZ that has a web server attached to it. That's something that I haven't finished setting up yet, so uh, you won't see that when we go through Hyper-V here in a sec, the Hyper-V manager here in a second. All the other VMs are just attached to the 10 gigabit uh, virtual switch. Um, one of the cool things about these virtual switches is it doesn't matter if the actual physical NIC is connected to anything or not. All of the devices that are attached to the 10 gigabit virtual switch, uh, the 10 gigabit NICs virtual switch um, stay connected even if I have to turn off my 10 gigabit uh, network for any reason. So um, that's something that I thought was kind of cool when I figured it out. Now you note that I do have two LAN interfaces on here, and that's because I have mixed media and I don't have a router that has um, mixed media on it. I 
have you know my standard one gig uh, RJ45 copper, and then I've got some SFP plus 10 gigabit stuff. Um, instead of investing in a specific switch to mix that media together, I decided to do it in PFSense. Um, and we'll go through some of the configuration struggles I had with that because it wasn't as simple as I thought it was going to be to get those networks talking to each other. So you're going to need a Type 1 hypervisor like Proxmox ESXi or Hyper-V. And yes, Hyper-V is a Type 1 hypervisor, guys. You're also going to need at least two open NICs on the server, one for a WAN and one for a LAN. You're going to need the latest PFSense ISO. You're going to need 5 to 10 gigs of open space uh, on your virtualization server for the VM. And you're going to need 1 to 2 gigs of RAM available on your VM to actually run the PFSense box. It will run fine with one. If you're going to use a bunch of plugins, I highly recommend two. Um, I only have like three plugins running right now, but I'm just on the edge of needing two. Okay, so we're going to switch over to the PC and we're going to go ahead and record uh, how to set up your hypervisor and uh, go through the, the install and initial configuration of PFSense. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is get your hypervisor host set up. So we're going to go into Hyper-V Manager since we're using Hyper-V. And here's my virtualization server. Uh, you can see my standard PFSense Plex Win 10 box for goofing off with in Zentall running. Um, the first thing that you need to do is set up the networking side of things uh, because obviously as a router, networking is going to be the primary issue here. Uh, so in Hyper-V, you go to the Virtual Switch Manager and then you can set up your virtual switches. Now I've already got them all set up here, but um, if you're doing this for the first time, you don't have them, you'll want to make sure that you set up your WAN and your LAN and you label them clearly so you know what they are. Um, when you set them up, you can specify external, internal, or private. So if you're doing something like a DMZ for a web server, you'll want to set up a private network. And you know what? We'll actually set that up now because I'm going to need that later. This is uh, internal DMZ. So by doing it as a private network, this is a virtual switch that has no access to the host VM. Only the things that's connected to, only the virtual machines that's connected to have access to it. That's really important for a DMZ because I don't want the web traffic that I funnel to it with my router to end up on the virtualization server at all. So make sure that you select private if you're doing a DMZ. If you're connecting to an actual NIC, you want an external. If you just want something that the host machine and VMs can attach to, then use an internal network. At this point, you should have all your virtual switches set up. You can go ahead and create a new virtual machine. So we'll call this PFSense demo. Um, I'm going to give it one gig of memory because that's really all the basic PFSense needs. Configure your networking. We'll go ahead and start with one gig WAN and we'll have to add some more before we're done. Um, we'll let that be. We don't need 127 gigs of space. Uh, we'll say we need only like, uh, we'll do 10 just in case. We end up needing that much. Install options. We're going to install from an image file, which I've got all my images stashed here. There it is. Since next and finish. And then the new VM will get created and provisioned and you can go to before you launch it go to settings make sure that you have all of the uh, network connections you want you can add new network connections easily enough so we're just going to go ahead and add the one gig lan which, yeah we'll add the one gig lan uh, okay and add hardware network adapter we'll add internal DMZ. So we'll go ahead and add both the LAN and the DMZ now. Why? Okay. All right, so now we've got those in there. We can go to connect. Oh, that fired off on the wrong screen and we can start the VM. So go through the install process. I'm not going to go through every step of the actual install for uh, PFSense because there are a lot better guides out there. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put uh, link thingy in the up there in the little eye in the corner um, to the guide that I used that I thought was really helpful. Um, he, uh, he, there were a lot of videos in the series that covered not just PFSense install installation itself and setup, but also basic networking, which was really, really helpful because like I said, I'm not that good at basic networking. An important thing that I haven't mentioned yet as I'm going through the initial setup that I want to mention is the devices 
the network devices in the PFSense are all named the same, HN0, HN1, HN2, so it's really hard to tell them apart. To know what they are, understand that they are numbered based on the order that they are listed here. So one is going to be my WAN, two, uh, zero is going to be my WAN, one is going to be my LAN, two is going to be my DMZ. Hey guys, Editing Taylor here. The section where I was going to talk about uh, the issue I had with using multiple NICs on the same network unfortunately got really screwed up. I didn't realize that there was some issue with the audio and so I had to kind of scrap it. I'm going to do my best to explain it real quick. When I set up, tried to set up the network with uh, two NICs on the same network, I did not realize that it was essentially treating, PFSense was treating them as two separate networks and uh, there's a lot of confusion um, about why I couldn't assign them in the same IP address range. Uh, PFSense treats every NIC on it as, an as a separate network, so I have to give them a different IP range. And then I have to actually, I had to create firewall rules to allow traffic between the two networks. So I had to make sure that the LAN NIC could talk to the option one or the extra NIC, and that vice versa, the option one NIC could talk to the LAN NIC. Um, it wasn't that hard to set up, um, especially using a... Um, blacklist methodology which is something I learned about from the uh, the videos that I previously linked um, where I've learned most of my information on PFSense and I'm going to link here specifically right now to the one on setting up firewall rules because that was really helpful when I was trying to figure out how to set up two NICs on the same network so uh, sorry for the little screw up there but back to the video okay uh, hopefully that was helpful and gave you a good idea of what it looks like to get your hypervisor set up and get PFSense installed on it. Um, I do want to make a few comments before I go about cutting over from your old router to the PFSense router. Be sure that you really understand what you're doing before you actually start unplugging things and plugging things back, uh, replugging things, because when you do this, you're going to break your network for a little while. Um, so make sure no one else is watching Netflix in the house or doing something like that. You don't want to piss people off. And also make sure you really understand what you're doing to finish the setup because if you're watching a YouTube tutorial like this one, it's going to suddenly cut off as soon as you unplug things. Um, and your network's going to be broken until you get it working again. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, throw a like on it. Also, if you have any comments or questions for me, leave them in the comments section down below. If you'd like to support my channel, you can do so by using the Amazon affiliate link in the description section. Thanks for watching, guys. Have a good one.